Uh, Owen, uh, tell us a bit about um, something like an, uh, an experience that you've had while you're, you know, um, GMing or playing that you look back on as sort of a, a moment when you were like, I want to do this forever. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting. I, I'm in the weird place where I was actually doing game role playing game design before I ever managed to play a role playing game. Um, and so I was hooked on that end of things pretty much immediately uh, because my Uncle Lucian had a copy of the first edition AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide, and that's all he had. And he told me, this is 1982, uh, he told me, if you can figure out how to play this game, uh, we can play it. And I was able to look through the book and see that there were things that you needed for a player character, things like armor class and hit points and attack rolls, that weren't included in that book. But there were notes about monsters having those things. So I wrote up rules for players based on the information on monsters, which was just simple one-line descriptions of, of stat blocks. And I'm sure those rules were terrible, but they were enough that it was possible for us to play a game, um, my uncle, myself, and my sister. And my sister hated it. She just thought it was the, the dumbest thing ever. And, and my sister is, and she's a full-blown geek. At one point, she owned every Star Trek novel that had, at that point, ever been published. Uh, and I'm told, whatever you did, Troy, it worked. You know, uh, I will be honest, I did absolutely nothing. Uh, well, in that case, <laughs> nothing in this case worked. And uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Tranquil Nova on YouTube says the hiss is gone. That is great. Yay. That is good. Uh, because with our mood today, we're the only two that can hiss. So we don't need a third robot hiss. But uh, go on, please. Um, and so after that, uh, that was during a summer vacation. And I went back to school. And I was looking for people to play role-playing games with. And there were no children my age or, or even within a few years of me uh, anywhere near my neighborhood. Uh, a thing that my mother has always said she didn't think about when she bought the house I was born into and has since regretted. <clears throat> uh, so there was no one to play with, and it came very, very close to me dropping out of the hobby just because there was no way for me to do anything with it. Uh, but my mother was part of the Norman, Oklahoma Science Fiction Association, so she asked her friends, hey, how do I get a, an 11-year-old boy some way to play role-playing games? And one of them knew about Tunnels and Trolls solo modules. Oh, wow. And for, for people that have not uh, played with these, they were huge in the 80s, or at least I thought they were huge. Um, basically, they are self-contained adventures. Uh, you use the core rule book, and it's like the choose-your-own-adventure stuff, except with game rules. So it'd be like, you know, you're attacked by two goblins, run that fight. Uh, if you survive, go to this paragraph on this page. If you die, go to this paragraph on this page. If you decide to try and flee, go to this paragraph on this page. And they had dozens of these things and some of them were interconnected right like they had uh a uh city one which was one of their biggest ones and it had an arena which if you went into the arena with the book it would say either go to this entire other module the the arena module or just run this one fight and see if you survive or you could fall into the sewer and the sewer had its own dungeon and it would be like either go to this whole other module or make this one check and see if you can get out of the sewer uh, and there was a tower with a mad wizard that had a through the looking glass adventure. And so those were all interconnected. And that let me play a lot, but it also meant that my very early experiences in the role-playing game industry uh, as a hobbyist were designing rules and then playing solo adventures, which means I was both functioning as player and to a certain extent as game master. I had to interpret the rules. I had to figure out what things meant. If I wanted to do something that the rules didn't allow for, I had to decide how I was going to handle that. And a year or two later, uh, I found some other people to play with. And so it was very, very common for me to play with them, but also to run games with them. So my introduction to the hobby, which is unusual, was to be designing my own rules and running games for myself and interpreting rules from the get-go. It was not until many years later that I discovered that there are people who play but don't run games or run games but don't play. For me, all of that was always an important part of the hobby. So I, I was hooked in that regard just from the very earliest moments. 
I love it. Uh, I actually worked pretty closely with that group of folks um, uh, with the troll with the troll father. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. With the, and it's um, you know it is interesting when you learn a little bit more about the texture of how things kind of came about. They were uh, they will they hold very fast to the claim of being number two. Like yeah. Dungeons and Dragons, and they were like, "This is too complicated." So Ken just like, "I'm gonna do a different. We're gonna do it live." And uh, live they did. So it is. Uh, it's definitely a beloved um, uh, franchise, I guess. And uh, and it still kicks around to a certain degree. And some actually some really interesting people of note, and as is the case with all of the, you know Green Ronin and uh, and other uh, tabletop roleplay developers. We're really, I mean, the mutant or not the uh, teenage mutant ninja turtles. Um, one of one of those creatives were involved, and it just goes on and on. Some really phenomenal people. Uh, let's see. Uh, I like this. Tranquil Nova says I didn't start uh, tabletop role play games until I was in my 30s. First GM experience was the Fantasy Age. Oh, oh wow, that's great. Love this system so much. I'm so glad that you stopped by. Um, it's great to have you here. Great to have everyone. And uh, yeah, so this is Thursday Age. My name's uh, Troy. I'm the disembodied voice that hangs out and just heckles Owen. I try to throw him off his game. I really do. I try to, I mean, you know, all in good fun because I love Owen. But I also love to tease Owen, and he comes out every single Thursday relatively unscathed where I feel like I have just worked my brains to its, you know, to its uh, – uh, inevitable, you know, overheating uh, conclusion, and uh, and you get out of it every time, Owen. Well, if the if the multinational, multi-year reign of Ninja Warrior has taught us anything about entertainment, it's that seeing people try something incredibly difficult <laughs> is entertaining, whether they succeed or fail. True. That. Uh, you know, I think it might be um, the entertainment aspect might be, you know, a little generous, but. I appreciate the sentiment. I really do. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about um, today's program. We uh, One of the things that we are doing is we sort of re – not retool, but as we flex and sort of work our, our muscles that we have built uh, specific to streaming, and we're getting better and better at it. I really do feel good about it. Uh, one of the things that we have noted is that people do really enjoy that practical – information that sort of resources and tools and things now they do enjoy uh, a good story and that is evidenced by the the um uh by the hours that people have been watching and uh, i gotta say owen you're a popular gentleman people do really enjoy um you know uh, what it is you have to share but today i was thinking we would have a, a go at tools required for the modern dm now you say dm or gm so I personally tend to go with GM because DM is short for Dungeon Master. And that yeah. makes perfect sense for Dungeons & Dragons, uh, which has origins specifically in saying, hey, here's a a dark hole in the ground, the adventure hole, like we discussed last week. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think <laughs> the, the generic term Game Master is better for discussing most games, because not even all fantasy games take place in a dungeon. Most of them don't, I think, these days. Some of them don't even include dungeons. Um, so I like GM. I like Game Master. Also, I think Dungeon Master is officially trademarked by TSR, even if DM isn't. So oh, no joke. Uh, okay. As a, I think. I think that is the case. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. But yeah. What, LJ? Oh, yes. Uh, I also use Ref frequently, which is short for referee. Oh, Ref. Okay. Okay. I like that. I think, you know, I like Ref because it does sort of give a, a some texture context to the, to the role, but so does, you know, DM and uh, for our friends in chat, tell us what it is. Or what do you call it? Is you call it game master? Do you call it dungeon master? Do you call it? You know what do you call it? Tell us all there, there, about it. There are games that use storyteller and chronicler and keeper. Uh, oh sure. That's another reason, honestly, why I like GM because it's it's uh, easily applied to any genre. Generic enough. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the tools for the modern day. Uh, we're going to go with um, GM. And, you know, when you are working on putting pieces together, let's let's start from the very beginning. And you're creating something. You're, you're magicking up a world and or a facet of a world that already exists. What do you have up on your computer? Or are you, you know, do you have an abacus and a, and a scroll and a feather quilt, like a, yeah, feather quill and. 
It's funny that you ask about the abacus. Uh, one of the things that I've got a bookmark to is omnicalculator.com, uh, which is literally a website with a, a hundred, sorry, 1,567 different free calculators on it. So okay. if you happen to find yourself needing to know what the volume of a sphere in square feet is, but you know the volume in inches, uh, that is a place where you can work that out. And they've got construction and conversions and ecology, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and and as a game writer and even sometimes a game player and GM, I find it very useful to just have that in my back pocket so I don't stress about trying to figure out, does this adaptation of this game rule require trigonometry? Um, but I honestly, usually when I'm starting with any writing project, I just pull up Word. Uh, I used to love WordPerfect, which I think was a universally superior program. But as a freelancer, most of the people I wrote for required stuff to be turned over specifically in Word files, not even RTF. So I just got used to writing things in Word. There are a lot of other tools out there. Uh, there are campaign managers that uh, do things like let you create hyperlinks automatically in your document. So if you decide there is a, a Dread Green Empire, every time you write Dread Green Empire, it will automatically link to your Dread Green Empire main entry so that you can click back and forth. And so if you're writing about hey, you guys are going to the Dread Green Empire where there's a tournament. You can then click on what you just wrote, go to Dread Green Empire and add, hey, there's a tournament here. So it's not just in your add notes about that specific adventure, but you're keeping track of it in the campaign note section. Um, other people I know use uh, some of the script writing tools that are out there, which allow you to put things in notes and that are connected and, and have a track bar for it. And I know a lot of, of writers and gamers who find those tools great. Um, I think one of the important notes here is anything that you find overwhelms you, you don't need to use. Anything you find you have trouble keeping track of or getting engaged with, there are tools to help you with. So I think rather than thinking of anything as being the thing you have to have uh, to play a role-playing game, these are all options to make it easier and faster for you. I personally like to game with a laptop top next to me because it allows me to take notes quickly and look things up quickly and uh, use uh, a sound bar or a sirenscape or something like that uh, to introduce sounds into it. I At one point, I played a character that had a magic horn in a game that my wife was running, and I literally had links to YouTube clips of different horns sounding so that when I used this magic power of that horn, I could click on it and the other players got used to knowing, oh, that means he's using his horn to summon someone. Hey, I love that. So what, what noise did you pick? Uh, for that particular one, it was the horn of Gondor from the Lord of the Rings. How, how did that sound? How did that sound? Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. And go. Hurt, hurt, hurt. I, I like that. It sort of sounds like a very sad goose. Yeah, well, that is sort of what it sounded like. It turns <laughs> out it is it is hard to uh, find cool horn sounds. They're, they're not as common as you might think. Uh, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a tuba player, so I, I oh, are assume... You really? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, not for like... years and years and years, but I, I went through tuba play all through high school. You know, that is one instrument that doesn't necessarily make a, an appearance in sort of these these opportunities, right? Nobody's like, uh, here's the magic tuba. Well, no, the magic tuba exists in the BG Sergeant Peppers and the Lonely Hearts Club band. And I, I know see. that because I'm a tuba player. And that is the only place you will find a magic tuba, as far as I know, in all of literature. You know what I'm sensing? And this is um, this is a warning to all. Respect the tuba, because Owen's serious about it. Very serious. Uh, uh, Tranquil Nova says, as long as it's not a trombone, I'm okay with it. You know, Tranquil Nova, I agree. When I uh, I was in, uh, I was just a youngster in school. I picked the trombone, uh, and uh, it was. Uh, thank you, Matthew Lee. I see that we're gonna we're gonna um, do we're gonna actually just drop a bomb on this um audio and and uh and sort it out but right now um for everybody uh, we're we are preserving your left ear and only listen in the right and um and if you're hearing it only on the left uh just turn your headphones around and then you'll hear it on the right 
Um, or if you like, conversely, just spin it back and forth real fast and it'll be semi-stereo, which is nice. Uh, that's a little tip from me, the technical guru of this particular organization. Um, but I was going to say, Owen, um, you know, I, uh, I had the trombone and I never played it. I only used it as a weapon. <laughs> and then I was subsequently asked to depart. <laughs> Uh, the the trombone is one of the few weapons that you've got to be, or sorry, musical instruments, weapons. We have to be really careful where you sit people because I have actually seen band groups make a mistake and someone gets dinged in the back of the head from a trombone slide. Um, <laughs> yes, so and sometimes that's, that's on purpose because kids are awful. Uh, yeah, Could have been. <laughs> it was high school. Who knows? We're, we were all terrible. That is true. Yeah. And I, you know, they actually started me out fairly early. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> Trinkle Nova says, I'm a music teacher and that checks. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love uh, it. I, I originally wanted to play the saxophone, um, but my first music teacher uh, in middle school said, you're not allowed to play the saxophone. You have to play the clarinet, which uses the same reed, embouchure, and fingering. And then later, if you want to, you can transfer to the saxophone. And my sister already played the clarinet, and I had heard enough clarinet screeches when she was first learning it. She got quite good, but obviously that is not where I, I was going with it, uh, that I had no interest in the in the clarinet. So I went straight to the tuba as the biggest, heaviest instrument possible, which is probably why I dropped out once we hit marching band. So in your um, you know, recollection of the things that you've done in the past, do you, um, do you incorporate any, like, you know, I know... I have never played a bard or any of that in any sort of uh, tabletop role play kind of thing. It's just not been my jam, uh, so to speak. <laughs> but um, have you ever included a magical instrument? Not a magic tuba, no. Have I included <laughs> magical instruments in games? Yeah, all the time. Um, I, I have, for example, uh, done things with a golden fiddle that happens to come from georgia that allows you to control devils you know, right drawing from, seems... from folklore yeah uh, i like that i've done a fair number of, of magical percussion instruments um i like stringed instruments and percussion instruments because the character can still speak as they're being used uh but i also i mean i was a big fan of of the magic flute uh, as a child growing up so there are a lot of of things to draw from if you want to write that stuff up, but I try not to force that into a game. I, I wait I gotcha. for someone to be playing a character who cares about music before I will introduce it. And if I'm a player and I have interest in it, I'll try and let a, a GM know early on. I really like the idea of this character having some sort of musical instrument that is magical or important or whatever. So you just shared uh, which a, is what led to my character having a horn, for example, you just shared something that's very interesting. And I think it's fun to note. And that is, first of all, enjoy the, what you're doing and, do a, an assessment of the people that are a part of your play session. And if they've got something that they enjoy that really would make the, the experience fun, then sort of layer on some version of that to, to suit their tastes and, uh, and have some fun. And, uh, and as a player to be able to say, here's what I'd like. I, I, you know, I'm really feeling like this character would be this kind of thing. That's really super fun. Uh, Nate Robin says, uh, uh, Oh, that's great. So a magic song hymnal that would cast spells on the listener. Okay. Yeah. See, I feel that's that. great. I uh, think, yeah. I, I had someone play uh, a bard type character who was a member of a church choir. And I literally gave them the ability occasionally to summon up a choir of angels who would cast spells for them. Um, How fun. Just, just from the, the sound uh, that was obviously a, a high end power that they could use limited number of times per day but yeah yeah um and it's it's interesting some people love having some concept uh that they're building towards for a character um to to go towards hey i i want i want to own a flying castle or i want a flaming sword or whatever um other players and gm sometimes prefer to take whatever random thing comes along and build their character around it so i think it can be important when talking people to say if there is anything that you particularly like or dislike or are interested in, um, let the GM know that, let me know that. Or if I'm a player and I've got particular interests, let the GM know. 
but don't make it a requirement because some people don't care. I've I've had people who bemoan the fact that uh, entirely random treasure generation has largely fallen out of being the norm because they enjoyed having a character where they were like, okay, so I've picked up uh, a flaming sword that's plus one, plus two versus dragons, plus three versus red dragons, because that would give them something to build a character around whereas they may not have ever thought of making a character who was anti-dragon, anti-fire, being given these things gave them that edge. The flip side of that is that there are people who hate having their characters be largely defined by the treasure that they pick up because then they figure it's not about my character, it's about whatever I'm carrying, uh, and really have some vision in their head where they're saying, I, I want a character who's all about cold and ice and, and, and has a... a ice weapon whatever and if they tell the gm that that is something that a gm can look for opportunities for i personally because i write adventures and, and game material i tend to craft these things custom or at the very least tweak pre-published adventures uh with that kind of idea so even if i'm running an adventure that was previously published if someone said i really want to be uh, a very ice cold winter based character and i'm reading through and they're like okay and here's a spear that allows you to do uh, thunder damage i can just say well i can just take that and change that to cold damage and and then it'll be something that the character's interested in i like that you know actually i want to make that into a t-shirt i do thunder damage <laughs> i'm not sure what that would mean but it sounds flatulent yeah uh there there are there's a reason why i've got uh, game night quotes on my social media right there are things that people say that are hysterical and frequently being taken on text just makes them funnier absolutely yeah you uh that's one of the one of the many uh gifts that i bring to this program and uh, to life in general and to you especially uh, yeah nave robinson something very interesting so that magic hymnal uh that uh that he was talking about um the no nate it sounds to me like you're saying the the singer of that w didn't require magic power. It was the hymnal that made it. Um, <laughs> Stan Brown says, pull my finger. I do thunder damage. <laughs> How crass, sir. How very crass. I never. Um, I, I mean, if you, if you look at medieval manuscripts with illustrated pages, the idea that there's a magic horn that does thunder damage if you pull the user's finger is well illustrated as a very common concept, which of course was picked up by Monty Python pretty early on. True so. that. I also want to uh, have everybody look upon the new overlay and let me know what you think about that. But if you look up in the right hand corner, you're going to see um, some thunder damage guy. That's what he's doing right there. He's up at the top. He's got a horn. He's ready to play some thunder damage um real fast let's see nate says uh we once had a huge uh a hug we had a hug we had a hug um it was uh the miss it was a uh cursed hug i remember i'm processing this um I, I, i'm guessing it was a hag Oh, hag, a hug hag. Once had a hag cast a spell of misfortune and cursed the party members, which means all the magic items they'd found in 24 hours. I, wanna, I want yep. that on a t-shirt, hug hag. I'm a hug hag. I'll tell you, when this pandemic is over, every single one of you, whether we've met or not, I'm going to hug you, and it'll be an extended hug for every human being. I'm going to be hugging people for the next three years. I miss everyone so much. So I will be the hug hag. But, um, oh, yeah, so um, interesting. And so back to the discussion on uh, very specifically the tools, because oh, when you have a talent to to uh, infuse what your, you know, your your uh, your habits and, you know, specific to the way that you do things with a lot of that sort of um, uh, practical your your philosophical uh, approach to some of this stuff, which is really informing. But I think sometimes the tools give people uh, – it's almost like bumper guards to keep you from going too far afield or really kind of moving down a workflow. And so we talked a little bit about the beginning, uh, what you start with. As you move into sort of uh, the crafting and creating part of that uh, – what are some of the resources that you have up or things that you use and how much of it is digital and then how much of digital replaced what you used to do? Because, you know, I, I imagine being surrounded by dusty tomes. Yeah. Um, 
digital has replaced most rule lookups for me because digital things tend to be more easily searched, right? If I've got a copy of Fantasy Age and I have it pulled open, uh, it is easy for me if I'm remembering, oh, isn't there some sort of rule about the healing action? I can type in healing action and everywhere those words show up in that sequence gets pulled up and I can look at. It's also a thing where if I know that I am going to have a monster that has uh, two different arcana, I can pull up multiple copies of this one rule book and have one set to the first arcana and the other set to the second arcana on different tabs on my desktop so that I am easily able to click from one to the other, um, even even when it's not my the, the, the NPC's turn, for example, if there's a pause or someone's trying to decide what to do, uh, I can remind myself what their options are. Same with having their stat block brought up. Uh, I also tend to use digital tools to keep track of uh, initiative order and how much damage people have taken. Um, but the flip side of that is that there are things that I like physical tools for better. Uh, anything that is a piece of information that should be relatively obvious at a glance or that is important for people making tactical decisions tactical decisions, I tend to prefer to have some sort of physical marker for. So for example, uh, I and my group normally use miniatures and maps, even for games that don't require miniatures and maps, like Fantasy Age uh -huh. is designed that you can use them or not, however you prefer. And we prefer to have them as a reminder of what's going on. So if I had said that there are five wolves and one wolf is is bigger and has a horn in the center of its head, uh, I will have a different figure for that bigger wolf than the other wolves. And so people will be looking at it and they'll go, oh yeah, one of those guys is different. And I can remember that also if like someone is poisoned or they are staggered or they're, or they're, they're on fire, we tend to either use little stackable magnets or little plastic rings as markers so that if you have if a player character's on fire, we can mark that that person's on fire and we all then remember at the beginning of their turn, oh, we have to deal with this fire damage. Whereas if I just write it down and we get distracted and everyone has to go and we're coming back to the next round, you might well not happen to remember. And then, you know, two hours later, someone's like, oh yeah, haven't I been on fire for the past 10 <laughs> rounds? Uh, yes, yes, you have. But as it happens, surprisingly, the fire was all on your cape and you didn't take any damage until just now. So here's 10 dice. Oh, well now I'm dead. All right, well, suddenly your character, you know, it's, it's just more convenient for those visual reminders. And again, those are style things. Uh, it's also great for drawing out the map, right? When I draw out the map, if someone asks me a question and I haven't thought about it, it's, are there any barrels in here? I can not only say yes or no, but I can say, yes, there are barrels in here and I can draw the Okay. And they're over here or have a little barrel figure, or it's not even unusual for us to use things like dice. Uh, frequently, if we're doing a campfire, a red D4 becomes the campfire and everyone knows where that is. Uh, dice are also great ways for, you can indicate walls or altitude. Some people prefer, to make custom terrain. And, you know, I just recently showed that uh, my roommate, my housemate, John, has constructed these trains um, that are designed for gaming. These, these uh, uh, foreground, I think is the name of the company, uh, 18th hundreds trains. And I've already started using them for the really wild West game I'm running um, so that, you know, you can pop them open and have fights in them, but it is useful if you line up a, a line of train cars you can hop characters back and forth and it's very easy to remember oh which car was i in well you're you're right there you're in the badge baggage car because that's where we have your figure as uh, someone pointed out uh Aaliyah tools magnetic markers uh in the facebook stream and that's one of the ones we've used and another one is a little set of plastic rings that you can hook over things so uh different yeah. people prefer different things i use both altitude markers are sometimes nice to remember someone is flying that kind of thing. Ah, so uh, how uh, how do altitude markers differ? So there are a lot of different altitude markers. Um, for a long time, the baseline in most of the games I played was to use little tiny six-sided dice to indicate how high up in the air someone was. So if they were five game inches up, you'd put a little five next to them, and you would just have to visually note, okay, if there's a little tiny die next to that character, that character is flying. We have also used uh, the Alia Tools magnets. So you can, for example, stick one magnet under them forever inch off the, the surface they are, which means that the characters that are flying higher uh, look taller. A lot oh, of people use the uh, plastic top 
of a container of dice. That's a big rectangle that's ah, clear yeah. plastic. And you can actually put that over smaller figures in case you're flying over them and put the figure on top. Uh, and then there are people that make actual acrylic flying markers that have like a big, you know, three by three platform and another platform on top and little scrunchy bands that you can slide up and down a series of numbers scratched on the side to tell you exactly how up, high up they're flying. So it's a combination of what is convenient and fast and what you have on hand and what gives you and your group the visual information that's most useful to you. I want to thank everybody who's tuning in. This is uh, Thursday Age with Owen Casey Stevens, and I'm the disembodied voice of Troy. And the question we're talking, we're talking about uh, resources and things that make the job of playing or GMing um, uh, a little easier, a little more fun, so you can focus on the things that you enjoy most. I have a question for people who are watching, and that question is this. What are some of the tools you use? Jonesy shared a link to Alia Tools. Um, we'll, we're going to share all these links and uh, and uh, credit you, and then um, you know we'll check out those products. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, share some links. What is it that you like the most to help uh, sort of, even if it's just, um, even if it's not a link to a product, but it's a, a spiral notebook or the thing that you just got to have, or you feel like you're, you know, uh, you've walked into school without any pants on, you know, ready to do that big presentation to everybody. What do you need to get the job done? And, um, and yeah, you were going to say something, Owen? Oh, um, just, you know, some of it is about the state of mind. Uh, I tend to have different sets of dice for different game systems. And I've got plenty of six-sided dice for when I'm playing some D20 game, Pathfinder or Starfinder or whatever. And I could perfectly well use those dark dice when I'm playing or running Fantasy Age. But I tend to prefer to have different Fantasy Age dice. And some of that is because sometimes I want to train my dice, which I'm wearing as a 100% voodoo uh superstition it has no bearing on reality but i don't want a d20 that i'm constantly wanting to roll a 20 to then have to learn to just roll a one um so that's that's a tool that i prefer the different dice for mental thematic feels so i know okay these are my fantasy age dice uh, and maybe these are the dice for this particular character and these are the dice for this campaign and as a result i've got a lot of dice uh Maybe I have too many dice. I'm one of those people that just likes dice. I, it's If I go to a, a big game convention, which of course I haven't in a year, um, but if I do ever again, I will swing by the various die tables. And that's how I end up with, you know, I've got a seven-sided die and a nine-sided die and an 11-sided die. I've got a hundred, Sometimes I, die. I am yeah. looking for things to do with my dice because they're weird dice. Right, right. I got to tell you, um, I don't, yeah, you're not alone in the skill at which people are able to create these dice. They are, they look like candy. I want to eat them. <laughs> They are beautiful. They're making them out of – I would – you know, I was so excited when I saw a, uh, a set of dice that were made out of metal. And I was like, oh, that's so great. Uh -huh. Until you get around the table and you roll them. And you're just like, oh, wow, I just left a lot of dents in your table. And it was very unpleasant to listen to. We literally had a friend that had solid brass laser cut edge dice, that's which looked I... super cool. And then they rolled them on our dining room table and left little tiny divots in the wood. Yeah, um, yeah. And so <clears throat> instead of not rolling dice anymore, that player bought himself a cheap uh, placemat and put that down and would roll his dice on the smooth plastic placemat. We've got some great stuff in the chat, and I want to just uh, read them out. Uh, Tranquil Nova says, I'm still new to GMing. Um, the pandemic kept me from more, uh, believe me. Uh, that's how this whole program uh, began, uh, as an inspiration in that, in that regard. But... Uh, uh, but I usually use a combo of physical and digital books and a good note app on my iPad. I like that pretty low key. Yeah, I mean, I, and I get that too, just kind of keep the clutter out. And oftentimes when you are, uh, I don't know if, if this is the case for folks who are listening, but sometimes just connecting to the internet introduces all kinds of different static and noise that have nothing to do with the thing you're trying to get done. And uh, for people like me with a uh, touch of the ADHD, it is a challenge to focus. So I get that for sure. Uh, Nate says uh, three by five inch cards folded in half over a DM screen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I like that. Um, and uh, yeah, Francisco uh, on YouTube uh, says uh, weighing in with I agree. I also use a combination of physical and digital goods. That's great. Uh, Nate Robbins brought up quick player cards. 
Now, uh, quick player, is that a brand or is that um, uh, maybe something that uh, Nate uh, sort of um, is calling a, a tool from home? Uh, Matthew Lee says uh, grid map, some sort of mini figure. Uh, meeples are great. I love meeples. Uh, index cards. I don't know what it is, but gaming, you know, because it has all of those small pieces and I, I love those little pieces. I've got a ton of them because I've got a plan, and so I end up you know, saving them. Oh, quick reference cards. Absolutely. Yes, that makes sense. That's great. Nate Robbins uh, clarifies, and that's wonderful. And, um, yeah, Tranquil Nova says, I don't use maps and minis often. only draw quick maps uh, in the, uh, the rare situation. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we talked a bit about some of those physical, digital things that you utilize um, uh, for that piece. What do you do when you – where do you keep your fragments of ideas? Do you let them marinate in that uh, beautiful brain of yours or you're fine, Nate? No worries, my friend. No worries. Um, uh, I used to simply trust that if I had a good idea, uh, it would sit in the back of the primordial soup that is my head and come forward when I needed it. Uh, Sometime when I turned, oh, I don't know, 40, I started to realize that I could remember having had good ideas, <laughs> but I could not remember what those ideas were. So I started having uh, idea lists. And this actually, some of this started uh, when I was working at a call center. I was doing a voice apart for a, a bank and I would have a little notebook. And if an idea came to mind, um, I was obviously doing other stuff and I couldn't, you know, wander away or get on another computer system or whatever. So I would just write it down. And sometimes it was just a cool sounding name, right? Uh, uh, Blaylock, for example, it's just a cool sounding name. I'd oh, run yeah. into a Blaylock and I'm like, Ooh, I would, I would I I want to do something word, with that. And I would just write down Blaylock. I made up the word um, hog dunker once. What? I made up the word hog dunker once. Yeah. Yeah. See? So beautiful, beautiful words like that. Um, nowadays, uh, frequently my ideas end up being turned into short, Twitter uh, posts so that I get them out there and other people can see them, even if it's a, a fairly short idea. And then I collect all those into great big documents I keep track of and can, in fact, troll through them anytime I need a good idea. And then I do have uh, idea lists. Uh, I've got one idea list on our smart speaker because if I'm in bed and it is three o'clock in the morning and I have a good idea, uh, we should do a dice set with that game. Um, I can just roll over and speak to my smart speaker and I don't have to get out of bed and I don't have to try and write. I know a lot of people that keep a notebook by their bed for good ideas. The problem is that if I write while I'm half asleep in the morning, I have no chance of understanding what I wrote. Oh, definitely. It'll be weird chicken scratch. And again, I will just be reminded I had a good idea once, but I will have no idea what that good idea was. So fun fact, um, when, uh, when I sleep, I will i will sleep work i will sleep eat and i will um and i'll sleep purchase things on the internet <laughs> so i've sleep I've, shopping is a really tricky one that is a bizarre i mean like i one day i've got like four velour track suits in the mail and i thought what in the hairy hog donker is this uh, Nate says, or Matthew rather says, uh, for my players, I bought Pathfinder plastic bases and told everyone to build a Hero Forge character and send me the link, and then I printed out all, oh, printed out a front and back view and put them in the base. That's a great idea. That's very yep. clever, and I like too that you do that because it creates the, a sense of ownership, not just of the character, but of the character in that space. Um, I think that's really a great context. I have been super fortunate with who I game with on a regular basis on many cases. Um, there are multiple artists who I have had in long running campaigns, uh, including Jacob Blackman and Stan uh, and Markham Curley. Uh, it has yeah, some of our favorites. not been at all unusual to find that the artists uh, end up drawing illustrations for all of our characters. Um, for that matter, uh, and I talked about this online at one point uh i'm in a game where there's a group of heroes known as the rune breakers and my wife who's an artist and a graphic layout person uh actually made the sigil of the rune breakers where she designed what a dragon rune looked like in that game and then broke it so we have this visual representation uh, of what our characters are using as our, our sigil and our badge and putting on our heraldry and such so when you are creating this experience and you're really kind of uh let's say it's a uh, 
you have your I'm certain you have your group of friends where it's a little more casual and a little maybe um, uh, uh, a little looser because you know that they get it. So you don't necessarily have to be so stringent. But do you ever find um, do you ever do something like a big showstopper event or a big thing that you're like the big reveal uh, beyond just like the the plot point? But are there other kind of tricks and, and things that you do to sort of amplify that uh, that energy? Sure. Uh, it depends on on what that what the big reveal is. Um, again, I'm a very visual person. So uh, for years and years and years and years, my friends have joked that if you buy me anything, be it a toy or a miniature or a, an album cover um, that has something that could show up in a role-playing game, I will probably produce that in a role-playing game at some point. And as a result, uh, this past October, which was my 50th birthday, which I couldn't get together with people as a result of COVID, a lot of people were sending me gifts to try and cheer me up, including a 12-inch tall Godzilla figure. And all of my friends who actually live here in the house or, or pop over for our social bubble looked at it and they're like, we're going to have to fight that, aren't we? We're going to have to fight a 12-inch tall Godzilla. <laughs> well, that's the sort of thing where I will put that within arm's reach possibly for weeks prior to planning to use it so that everyone gets used to it being there. And then when I say, you know, you the, the ground's shaking and you hear the roar and I'll reach over towards it and everyone's like, no, he's going for the Godzilla <laughs> figure, it's a Tarrasque. Um, but I've also done things like uh, I've, I've taken small figures and I've printed them on sheets of paper and then folded those into tents and I've been like, it's a 72 foot tall elephant. And I've got, you know, five sheets of eight and a half by 11 paper to represent it. Um, or if there's uh, art that I've custom made, I I've, will commission an artist and, and pay them for art, for things that I'm putting in my games. Like this is a major villain. It's a, it's a six armed snake woman with, with, six shot pistols and I will get someone to illustrate that so I can say she looks like this specifically. Um, and I really find that those things can make someone or something more noteworthy. The more firmly players have an idea of what something is in mind, the more likely they are to latch onto it. Yeah. Weirdly, another thing I've discovered about that is that frequently that means I should not use complicated made up words or names to describe something because a lot of my players, players, a lot of my players just won't remember that. Um, like I have had in multiple campaigns of mine, the eternal city, the bridge city, Sorbac Cac Delbaz. Now oh, wow. I can have Sorbac Cac Delbaz just roll off my tongue. I made it off, made it up myself. But I think one of all of my players has ever successfully remembered Sorbac Cac Delbaz, whereas most of them remember the bridge city. So anytime I do something like that, I, if I'm going to try and have, hey, I've got this made up language, I'm doing conlang stuff, I want it to be Sorbac Cac Delbaz, I will also mention the bridge city so that they will have this thing that they can remember and refer to back and forth. One of my current big villains is Professor Ajlak, but no one can pronounce that. So they just refer to him as the Venom King because I originally introduced him as the Venom King and that is a thing they can remember. Those are two words that go quickly and easily together. I love that. And what's interesting about that as well is that uh, it, those are some some low hanging fruit when it comes to get allowing people to feel some ownership uh, that is much like life you know uh, um, there are people you know complicated things to say get shortened and every city gets sort of a nickname and and depending upon your particular you know um uh, you know who who you are within the you know within that culture you call it all kinds of different things and so that i love that and then taking sort of what the players will do as a shorthand and kind of maintaining that uh Something that uh, is interesting, uh, Francisco brings up, and good to see you again in uh, in our chat, Francisco. Uh, uh, that uh, they GM Blue Rose and uh, the Q Shop dice for each game, uh, they're fantastic. Yeah, uh, those are the Blue Rose ones. You know, Blue Rose has that aesthetic that you know I've said it before. It's just like a Xanax for the eyes. It's just very soothing. Blue, Blue Rose is gorgeous, and I have a set of the Blue Rose. Uh fantasy age style dice uh, which is nice because you've got two dice of one color and one die of another color that are of the same style so they feel like they go well and that is another case where i hold on to those dice 
for only when I'm running or playing Blue Rose. I don't use them for any other gauge game. I, I hold on to them and reserve them so I can get out. And they're, it's a serene sort of powder blue and a nice yeah. white. Yeah. Um, I'm going to cosplay I've, a I've cover got... of, a, of a Blue Rose adventure. Do what now? I'm going to cosplay the cover of a Blue Rose adventure. I'm just going to. Oh, good luck, man. Yeah. I'm mean, just going to be floating on a cloud of, you know, just bliss. Oh, yeah, our just, buzz is just back. Remember to spray paint an actual deer gold. Yes, a living deer, I think, is probably the way to go with that because I want us to be majestic and friendly. Ooh, I hear that. Wowzers. Um, so you know what, my friend Owen, um, we have uh, a couple well, – and then it stops just like that. It's like a magic trick. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I will continue to do it and or not do it. Um, as, <laughs> okay, I don't really I'm, I'm, don't have anything in front of me, so I must be doing it with my mind. Um, but I wanted to um, – I wanted to do a couple things. First, as we uh, kind of wind down our, our program for the day, uh, I think we've got a few things that we would like to, to wrap, some things we want to share with some folks. And um, do you, off the top of your head, Owen, can you think of anything that, that you'd like to get some people involved in? Well, uh, sometime soon, we're going to be doing a playtest, which I will definitely want people to be involved with. Uh, the details of which are being sort of slowly rolled out as we iron them down. <clears throat> uh, but I'm sort of hoping that something we'll be talking about maybe as a, a whole episode in a week or two. Absolutely. And so I'm going to say unto people watching, and if you're re-watching this, if you've watched it before, we'll say Monday, um, Monday the, uh, the what? Um, what is next Monday? What is today? What are we doing? What is this? Um, Let's see, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, was that the 24th? We'll say the 24th, regardless of that, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, if you send a note to Let's Play at GreenRonin.com, I will share with you a way that you can connect directly with some of the things that are going on. And I mean immediately. And that's just for the people, the early birds, the, um, the early adopters, the true fans. Uh, yeah, if, if yeah. you are if you're a fantasy age fan and you've got a group and you would you would be interested in playing some fantasy age stuff uh drop troy a line yeah um, dude, yeah troy yes we uh we have some art that yeah. i have put you in our slack oh no i cannot yeah. wait i'm gonna i'm gonna look into that and um yeah so get get in get in on that let's play at green ronin.com now if you're listening to this after the the 24th um, I'm so sorry. It is just, um, yeah, it is just too late, my friend. But uh, maybe next time, uh, you know, in, in the interim, it never hurts to ask. I'm, well, I mean, drop Troy a line at Let's Play at GreenRanine.com anyway, just, right? just so he knows that you love him. Yeah, yeah. Well, it really, you know, I am just the, um, I'm the, the bucket for which all the uh, love for Owen goes into. Well, that sounds odd. I'm going to rework that. We'll workshop it. But if you want to share yeah, that with Owen Yeah, let's workshop well, that a little bit. Yeah, let's... that's not uh, that's not my favorite. Why not? Not my favorite thing. Um, this is uh, waiting for this. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Um, I'm going to I'm going to I'm sorry. I'm laughing. I'm just talking about a thing you cannot see, but I will definitely make this ready because it's it's a glorious, it's a glorious thing. Um, but yeah, so we've got that cooking. I want to say something else. Um, one of the things that we have done since the pandemic is we're embracing the live streams and we're embracing uh, doing, you know, uh, some engagement stuff and really getting out there and, and connecting with people in a, in a more, you know, we just find that when we don't have the opportunity to do things like go to a convention and see you face to face, as much as it leaves you sort of bereft of, you know, you know, the the things that we're creating and the people that create them, it leaves us a little empty too. And so we're just trying to fill the adventure hole by doing a lot of uh, events and things. And Francisco, I, you're the one that clued me or that that sort of cued me to say this. And so I, I definitely am speaking right, Troy, the love bucket stand. You shouldn't probably draw that. Do it. Draw it. Do it. Um, but, uh, uh, Francisco, I want you, um, and anybody that's listening, send me as you can, uh, your information, reach out to let's play at greenrona.com. I have a very special 
series that we have yet to announce. You're the first to kind of hear of this, and I want to invite you. It's uh, it's not something that you're going to see on announced. It's something that we are handpicking people. And so if you're interested in that kind of opportunity, I want you to reach out to me directly. And um, oh, absolutely. Tranquil Nova says, thank you, Green Ronin Publishing, for doing these virtual sessions and chats. I hope these continue and grow. Me too. And I'll tell you something else. Um, Owen, the good news is we're growing. More people are coming. Yep. We're, our technical prowess is getting there. And uh, most certainly, like we are, we are starting only late, <laughs> and only in the that window of like five to ten minutes. And uh, but we're getting better at it, and we certainly are going to expand and grow and uh, think of some new fun things to do. And you know, a big part of that is your suggestions. And so, um, you know, and I do want to say to you, thank you, you the the generosity you show by coming and being a part of thing like you do it every time and you know sometimes you and i both have a case of the mood poisoning but i'll tell you at the end of it my uh my dopamine levels are high i've uh i've definitely come away happier than i'm not there's a significant advantage to being able to reach out to people uh virtually in a way that is archived right i i enjoy talking to people about games and gaming um i think games and gaming are important and one of the one of the ways that we can actually bring people together and try and improve the world and, and learn something about ourselves and, and about the people around us. Um, and no matter how many conventions a game professional hits, you can only talk to so many people. And frequently, whatever you say only exists in their memory and their notes, right? So, uh, and there are people that just can't go to conventions. There are, there are people with mobility issues. There are people with financial issues. There are people with time issues. So the ability to put something out uh, archive it on YouTube and, and, and whatever, uh, and have people be able to, to click in if they have time or watch it later, if they don't, it's a great way to try and get this stuff out there. And yeah, I hope as time goes on, we'll be able to start doing things like announcing our topic in advance and, uh, being on time and quite possibly having, having stop, a, stop a showing better people how we make sausage. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, but again, I, I, I personally like that this is uh, a bit rustic. If I'm going to be but great honestly, British so do I. I want people to enjoy and to hear some unvarnished stuff. But the, yeah, I think yeah. you're. I think you're also right that we need to also add a little bit of the, um, you know, a little pre-prep, which I have been doing. I've been getting better at, like this beautiful overlay, which I'm kind of a fan of. I really do kind of enjoy that with our, um, you know, our thunder thunder damage. And, um, you know, speaking, speaking of thunder damage, I want to, uh, to share, um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, Stan, you are what I would like to call a, a delight and, um, you have drawn a picture here. I'm going to swing into it. I'm hoping that all the audio, um, continues, but if it doesn't take a look and you will enjoy this new piece of artwork, pull my finger, says a gentleman to the dragon and the dragon's like no thunder damage it's my pain can everybody see and hear me um let's see oh everybody uh jason is here we are going to um start the show over <laughs> we're going to start it over jason's made it um finally jason we've been waiting for you for um over an hour and so you know that's fine though i mean that's great can everyone hear that can you hear it, Owen? I hear it. I really like this music. It's a little kind of, um, it's kind of fancy, kind of jaunty, if you will. And I like to think, Owen, it, of you as jaunty. It, it is very 50 sitcom jaunty. It is, why I yard. That music means that it's time to say ta ta, as they say. And, Is that what they say? Uh, they, you know, some people. Um, I also hear that they're liking uh, on it, like the bonnets. Okay. Yeah, the bonnets are big. Bonnets are big right now, on. And so next stream, I would appreciate it if you could step into the now and put on a bonnet. 
um, one division. Sure, I mean, if sure. I'm having a bad hair day at Bond, it's probably better than my other options. Yeah, you know, and for people like me, who have got uh, very curly hair, um, every day is sort of a bad hair day. Shades of a, you know, shades of a bad hair day. But we have come to the end of the program. Owen, again, thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I see you, sir, and I see what you do, and I see your love for the game, and I see your love for the people who play it, and I see you do this because you want to be the person to do this. It's, uh, it's a joy to watch, and I do appreciate that. Do you have any um, any thoughts before we call it a day? Nope, I'm good. All right, friends, I want to thank you so much for hanging out with us. It's truly, truly appreciated. Remember, I've said some pretty important things, one of those being send me a note, let's play at greenlonen.com. It is really important that I hear from you if you want to get involved in some things that are um, very special. I think you'll enjoy them. But if you don't send me a note, you're not going to know about it. So do so, and we will see you. Um, I will I will hear from you. You will you will hear my voice. You will not see my body because I am disembodied. On Monday, we have Mutants and Masterminds Monday. Um, I also want to remind people that um, we have uh, we've launched the Patreon for Mutants and Masterminds. And uh, oh, and did we do an article today on um, staff Patreons? No, it's going to be coming out soon. Nice. There'll be an article that'll show off uh, staff Patreons. You know, this is a, a difficult time, and I got to tell you, our content creators are yeah, content creators in general. They'll they're going to save the world, and uh, and I think we need to support them in all the ways that we are able to and can afford to. Uh, so we'll share some of that information. And uh, Mutants Masterminds Monday is at 2 p.m. Pacific, and that's generally when we do our things, and we follow up again with Thursdays with Owen Casey Stevens, a uh, dear friend and just a joy to work with and to listen to. Uh, I truly appreciate it, and we will be back later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Owen. Thanks, Troy. All right, bye, bye folks. Bye.